We are going to save time now because um, Dr. Bailey has asked me not to read his bio. He's the next speaker, which actually makes me embarrassed because I think my bio contained my elementary school and nursery school. <laughs> so over to you, Mark. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, and I would like to introduce my colleague, Judith, Judy Gergaro. She's uh, her bio is also in the group. And we wanted to talk to you about the Pathways Initiative. And um, just want to, as similar to Lynn, uh, acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. And uh, including right now, we're on the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, as well as the Wendat peoples. Now, most importantly, the point is, is that, uh, as you heard from Lynn, uh, unfortunately, our, our First Nations have been uh, people who've been experienced a lot of brain injuries and concussions. And that's why it's really important that we uh, outline a really good map of care. So I have really no disclosures related to the talk I'm going to give. Uh, and I have other things that I've got, but I'm not going to, they're not related to what we're, so by the, we're talking about. So we hope that by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to describe the overarching framework and features embedded in our ideal pathway after concussion. Uh, we will talk about some key indicators that measure whether people are following the pathway. And Judy's gonna talk about some of the data that we have about concussion care in Ontario and some of the gaps that we know about. So I think you are, I, I'm speaking to an audience that knows these facts, but from our data, we know that about 175,000 people have a concussion, which means you're talking about 35,000 people who would, who would in, even in Ontario alone, would have persistent symptoms. And from the data from the databases that we have, and again, these are limited because they don't talk to every type of injury, where it's date documented, um, we see a very, very large uh, group who have falls. And so we just wanted to remind everybody that uh, at these QR codes that we're coming up, we are uh, there's fall prevention month and details about it, that are from Parachute Canada. And you can take your phone and scan there. And then there's also a nice professional resource on um, adult falls. And we're gonna talk, this is gonna become relevant when you see some of the data that Judy will show. So we created the idea of the pathway. So you might ask, well, you just heard from Sean Marshall about guidelines and we've heard about different strategies from others and we heard about this. Well, what's a pathway? Well, the pathway is different in that it really outlines the trajectory of care that people should have. It's really speaking to the system of care more than guidelines which are focused on what a clinician should typically do. And so a pathway sort of one of our biggest problems that we believe, it, and you'll see the data, is that people don't get recognized, they don't get care. So it's the pathway of care that's the problem. It's not necessarily that when they land up with a specialist, they don't get good care. It's that they never got to the specialist because there's no pathway outlined. So this is kind of what we found as we looked at this. We knew that there was limited available availability across the three populations we're talking about. We're going to specifically talk about concussion today, but we also have pathways for moderate severe traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury. We have we uh, we we also recognize that um, in the system, people think of you having an injury, and again, we're speaking to the converted here, and then you're better. But the system of all of these diagnoses, um, these are complex chronic health conditions that really need lifelong, uh, sometimes lifelong support. And we know that there's a problem with the community uh, services and support, and it depends on whether you are injured in a public. Uh, uh, system or you have third party funding like motor vehicle accident, military or other uh, or, or WSIB where you have um, a difference in the availability of care. And we know that these gaps in care are magnified for those who are particularly marginalized. So people who don't speak English, you know, people, uh, intimate partner violence, I think we've heard alluded to there. These people are traditionally marginalized and don't get the care. So we felt that no matter what we came up with for the pathway, we had to tailor them to the individuals who are um, vulnerable as well with considerations for equity. And so we're grateful that we were funded by the Ministry of Health. Um, and so this is the overarching framework. It's for those of you who will say, oh, that's not that different. Yes, it isn't that different. But in a moment, I'll show you how it does differ a little bit. So the general overview is that, you know, there should be a pre-acute phase of these, which is the recognition part. We'll talk about that in a moment. The green is the acute care, what should go on in diagnostics. 
Um, I think I have a laser here. Yeah, I do. Uh, the next part is the rehab and the community support and concussion that we know and uh, is important. Now, I just want to highlight that this um, work um, is really uh, from, we have hundreds of people who've been involved in this, who've told us where the build, what the building block should be. Many of you are in the room. I know Dr. Tatter and others have helped us with this. Uh, and so it's really important to recognize that this isn't just Judy and I doing the work and coming up with a good idea. This is many, many people and many, many people with lived experience telling us what's missing. So just to kind of highlight a few things, uh, we know that it's not just about this pathway, it's also about the importance of primary care and family doctors being having a team of people they work with, as well as, as I already alluded to, the importance of recognizing that every pathway will be modified by the, own, the person's environment and personal condition. So let's, now, if I, I would just encourage you, I know it's lunchtime and you're probably, lunch is just about in your stomach and the blood is now rushing down to your stomach. So with the last fiber that's still working in your brain, if you can hold up your phone and just go to the website, it might be good just so you can see what we did. Uh, we are not going to spend a lot of time because we're limited in actually um, showing you the website today. But what I wanted you to do is go to the website and what you'll see is you'll see the pathways. And these, uh, again, the rudimentary ones, you can still see across the top, blue, green, orange, red. But more importantly, you'll see all of the different steps that should occur at each of these steps. These are building blocks. These are not guidelines. They're not saying you should use a CT scan. They're talking about general things that got to happen. For example, we need to know what kind of person this is. We need to document a number of considerations, how they got injured, and a lot of demographics about them. Um, we need to recognize a suspected concussion in the field. We know that's a problem. Uh, we heard about that from Dr. Novinsky. So, you know, these are the different things that have to happen. And when they get transferred to acute care, then th we need to make sure that they get the proper assessment by a, specialized, a specialist. And then once you get there, there's a lot of things that have to happen if you're not getting better. And the pathways outline a whole bunch of different things um, if you go to them, reminding you, you have to navigate to the, uh, to the uh, concussion pathway to get the specifics. Similarly, uh, we, we realized that, oh, that's really good. We've got these lovely bo uh, blocks of care, but we need to measure whether people actually got it. And so each of these steps have been, if you go into the website, you'll see there's another section on companion quality indicators. And Judy's gonna give you a bit more detail about that, but each of these blocks. And if you're on the pathway, you'll see this A, B, C, D, E, F. These are gaps in the pathway that we have identified with people lived experience and people who work in the system that are currently problematic. So that's kind of an orientation to it. And uh, as I, so this is kind of the key things that are missing from the current concussion pathway. And I'm gonna highlight the ones that are in boxes, but I, I think it's critical to recognize that there are many gaps. These are the letters I told you about, but here's the things um, in, le we know that from you've heard this already today that the lack of training and education about symptom recognition for non-medical professionals in the field is critical in that pre-acute, that's why it's blue. Um, we know that in uh, there's different difficulties with the transition of people through the different stages that they don't get appropriate transition planning. And when they transition to their family doctor, there's a lack of availability of outpatient specialized multidisciplinary care. And there isn't interprofessional collaboration, particularly in the mental health realm, we'll talk about in a second. So um, we, we know that, there, that there's a gap because of access to third-party rehab, depending on your funding mechanism. Sure. Um, and then what if you're still not getting better? How do you reaccess the system? Or even if you got missed, and Judy's going to talk to you about how many people actually get missed for medical care. And then many have uh, challenges with return to school. We've heard about that and life. And then um, we, we really um, ran into some problems with uh, how people are being assessed in the concussion pathway. So there's, we heard about the new diagnostic approach, 
Um, there's challenges in making an objective diagnosis that's very well known to all of you. It's very heterogeneous and therefore people don't always follow the right, the same pathway. And um, there's really no clear prognostic model for, for us to use. We're working on it. I think the science that we're sharing today shows that we're getting closer. Um, but there's also a wide diversity of providers treating concussion patients. And this results in a kind of wild west of care in the community. So these are things that we've come no, known. So the key things that we think we should be trying to implement in this pathway is ensuring the diagnosis is made by a professional who has the right training so that we can identify any red flags and do a full differential. People are not getting educated about what their concussion should, uh, what care they should receive and what supports are available. We have to screen for any risk factors for and, and sort of look for those who are not going to get better. Um, and we need follow-up within two weeks. And Judy's going to present the data on that. And if people are still symptomatic at four weeks, they, the guidelines say that you should get a specialist referral. So this is the challenge. Uh, Dr. Tatter was one of our steering committee for our data analysis. Um, we have a lot of problems trying to pull together. What you're going to see from Judy is what we have. But there's a lot of databases. There's um, administrative databases. There's insurance databases. There's community provider databases. And they don't talk to each other. So it makes us really hard to do this. But we're working on trying to create some linkages and between them so we can start to look at what people are actually get. Um, and then even when you say, okay, there's a database and insurance, it doesn't mean they use the same diagnostic codes and things like this. So there's really poor measurement of non-medical care. There's um, really access to other services like insurance and availability of primary care. Really, we, we really don't have great data on that. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Judy. She's going to tell you what it looks like. Thanks, Mark. Um I'm going to stand here so I can look at my slides. Um, I could, ooh, there we go. Um, I could I could talk for an hour on all of this, but I'm just going to go through it really quickly. Um, we developed the, the companion quality indicators, and it was done as a co-development process, and we matched it on to the ideal care pathway. We came up with about 71 uh, companion quality indicators, but there were 34 that were prioritized as being essential to measure in the system. So we got all excited, and then we realized, oh, shucks, we can only actually collect data on 13 of them right now. And then of those 13, there's even fewer of them that actually directly measure the care that people after concussion are getting. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of how we are collecting data. And we think about the insurance databases, a lot of them count things, how many patients, cost of care. They're not really looking at what people got as care and what the outcomes were from that. So there's some fundamental data problems. Um, we also looked um, within this report card at different key stratifiers just to look at what was possibly modifying outcome. So I'm I'm just going to sort of go through a couple of key ones, but there was going to be more data that becomes public in the next couple of weeks. So in terms of our cohort, it's fine to use diagnostic criteria, but we also, that was an incomplete way of looking at it just because the diagnosis doesn't always uh, it's not overly prognostic sometimes. So we combined it with the healthcare utilization. So if somebody had a concussion diagnosis and they were zero days in a hospital, that's that first group. And then we also found there were people with a concussion diagnosis who spent one to three days in hospital. So we called those folks the complex mild. So you can see, you can see the numbers. If we look at how this breaks out across the age group, we've got kind of a U-shaped curve. And for mild tra trauma and for complex mild, it sort of increases as you get older. And so this is data from across um, six uh, fiscal years. And every year it has the same shape. It's not like there's one year that's skewing this. This is actually representative of the, of, of the way it is fairly consistent, consistently. So we're really making the point that concussion is not only a younger person's injury. In fact, it's a pretty significant injury for people who are older, but there are lots of people who are not in this cohort. So this represents the people who are diagnosed by a physician, right? So anybody who's got a diagnosis by not a physician isn't gonna be in an administrative database. 
Um, but older patients are overrepresented in the complex mild group, and they are the group that are overrepresented around people who have ALC or alternate level of care days. And as Mark noted, the most common is falls. So when we look at physician follow-up, we know that the guidelines suggest that you should be followed up two weeks. So these are for people who were zero days in hospital, so they've gone to the ER, and um, best practice guidelines is that they should be followed up within two weeks. So if you look at this, you can see that there's just over 40% of people who are followed up in 30 days. Right. And so it the it gets better as we go up the chain. But, you know, if we look at the far, oops, that was not right. If we look at the far right, you can see that there's still almost 20 percent of people who have not been followed up by any kind of primary care or medical specialist in 365 days. So for the folks who were um, on the call last night, one of the things that I noted about all of the people on the patient panel is how long it took them to get sorted to the right level of care. And this is a visual representation of, of that. Um, if we look at healthcare utilization, so if you just look at the mild traumatic, so that's the green arrow or the sort of lighter um, green arrow or the complex mild. A couple of things to note. The blue are emergency visits. The orange are outpatient mental health visits. And then the, the gray are the inpatient usage. And this could be inpatient acute or inpatient rehab. And the solid color is looking zero to two years after injury. And then the sort of lighter color is looking at two to four years post-injury. So a couple of things that struck me when I looked at this data. One is there's an awful lot of orange, meaning there's a lot of people who are getting healthcare utilization for mental health reasons. And this is whether they, we looked at this in our database, whether they had an actual mental health diagnosis, but we also looked if there was um, utilization that were coded for a mental health reason. So they didn't necessarily have to have a mental health diagnosis. And it's there's a lot of orange in general, but if you look at the mild TBI, that orange bar really doesn't dip. So there's a high usage even four years up to injury. And I would suggest that if we were doing a better job of getting people into care sooner, that maybe this these bars wouldn't be so high. I'm just I don't, it's just my thought. Um so there's also a lot of regional um, variation. So if you are in a rural or a northern area, you're less likely to receive specialized care at any stage, whether that's acute um, rehab or community. And you're also less likely to be followed up by primary care. Um, there's a lack of publicly funded post-acute assessment follow-up and care across all regions, and it's even worse when you get into northern and rural regions. So that's why the work that Dr. Green has been doing with tele-rehab is really important because it's a, it is one way of getting people specialized care um, in areas where they're not having access to that care. So if we look at the key data takeaways, um, we know concussion is common. You guys all know that. Um, but really, once people are discharged into the community, there's really a lack of consistent and timely, appropriately specialized care and follow-up. And primary care engagement is really inconsistent. And this is, I mean, there's a few reasons why this is the case, but it's a problem that it's the case. Um, better care coordination is needed in general, but particularly for those over 65. And there's a real issue with folks after falls um, not being identified as having a concussion and not being properly rooted to the level of care. So this is a real concern. There's a number of us working on this. Um, and there's also a need to increase the availability of mental health supports and improve access to those services when people need it. Um, so a lot of people say, well, now what? So we're working on knowledge mobilization and I think there's a real obligation on the system to be better. It's not up to the patient. Um, to kind of figure out what they need. It's up to the system to be able to be set up to give them what they need. And so we've got a lot of different ways of doing this, working on um, getting to healthcare providers um, who are likely to see concussion patients. 
And we do on that interactive website, we funded a number of implementation projects to fill gaps in the pathway. And the, these are just two at the bottom. You're gonna actually hear about the Toronto Concussion Navigator a bit later today. And also the central link is an excellent resource as well, but I encourage you to, to take a look um, at our website. So who's working on all of this? We have a lot of um, uh, co-creation partners in working groups and steering committees. And I put people with lived experience as the first group of experts because those are the most, I think, important experts that we listen to and we're, we're needing to make improvements in how the system uh, works. And if you wanna get involved, just send us an email. And these are the key messages. And again, evidence-based care pathways provide the framework, data reports can inform system performance, and that we need to focus on care across the continuum, particularly in the community. And that's me with 26 sections left to go. <laughs> Thank you very much, Judy and Mark. Um, Judy, I didn't read your bio, but as you can tell, she's an expert clinician and researcher in uh, brain injury and spinal cord injury and, and the director of this initiative that they just spoke, of, spoke about. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, Charles, go ahead. Well, a huge amount of work has been done. We're all grateful to the team for this um, tremendous analysis. And it really um, reflects what we see playing out in our offices, that the system is not working. And I was very pleased to hear your fighting words. <laughs> um, both of you, I think, uh, are using language that is very appropriate. And I hope that um, this becomes well known and not just in the room that there's a problem. So thank you for doing this work. Thank you. Nice commendation. Um, there's a few questions on the chat. So um, this one's for Dr. Bailey. Do you have a care pathway for those who are not presenting to the hospital, but to their primary care practitioner or sport med physician first? I suggest that the community generally tries to filter to fight for good care, but lack resources available in a hospital-based program. So the, yeah, so the uh, pathway, you can be diagnosed in the acute setting by a doctor who's outside of an emergency room. It's, we just know that in Ontario, it's around 70 or 80% are seen in an emergency room, but the pathway still is relevant if you're diagnosed by a physician in their office or a, uh, somebody who's uh, working like in the in a walk-in clinic, these are appropriate still to follow the same pathway. You should have a follow-up within two weeks. You should be referred uh, along the way. So we we still believe that regardless of how you're diagnosed, this, this pathway is still relevant. Double-headed arrows. Yeah. Yes, there's double-headed arrows. <laughs> <laughs> we acknowledge people don't move linearly across this pathway that's built in. Yeah. Gentlemen, I know we're no more chat. Can I just ask a quick question about your connections? Just to Charles's point, um, you're connected to the Ministry of Health. So this presumably, okay. <laughs> Do you want to just yeah, uh, speak so, to that? So I think what we're what we're currently working on is uh, connecting with what's known as Ontario Health and working on uh, the connection, concussion standards uh, and brain injury standards that will actually make it a standard of care for, for the province. So that's our access in right now. And we're trying to meet with people like David Kaplan and others who are at Ontario Health to make this part of the day-to-day -day way people should be working. So that's that's our current strategy to put this in practice. Thank you. We'll see if you can wish us success. Yes, <laughs> I, we all do. With fighting language. 